I'm Linus. Welcome to Kids Talk Church History, a -a one-of-a-kind podcast where kids investigate the history of the church. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. As he kept his promise, come with us on a trip through history to find the answer, here on Kids Talk Church History. Have you ever heard anyone say when they're discouraged about the world around them that we're back in the dark ages? What are those dark ages? And were they really dark? Did people believe the earth was flat and thought the world was going to end in the year 1000? Did the church live in ignorance and superstition until Martin Luther rediscovered the truth? Stay with us to find the answers to these questions and more. I'm Emma. I'm 15 and live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm Trinity. I'm also 15 and live in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm Christian. I'm 13 and I also live in Charleston, South Carolina. There are a few pretty common myths about the Middle Ages. One problem is that we often talk about it as if it were pretty much the same for a thousand years. Yeah, even the expression Middle Ages came out much later. I think it was in the 18th or 19th century when people thought of the times of ancient Rome and the Renaissance as great ages and everything in between as something a bit messy. But if you think about it, isn't every age messy? Yeah, and the Middle Ages were a time of new discoveries and inventions. So was it really right to call them the Dark Ages? No, I don't think that's right. There were some dark times, especially in the beginning, but there are also times of great progress. Even the term Middle Ages is a bit of a misnomer because it marks a period of time in between, you know, quote unquote, important stuff, as if the Middle Ages didn't count much. But in this episode, we'll just call it the Middle Ages. It's better than Dark Ages anyway. But when did the Middle Ages start and when did they end? Most historians say that they started with the fall of Rome in 476 and ended around the time of Columbus in 1492. But that's just because they had to find some dates. Not everyone agrees on those. Also, after the city of Rome and much of the Western Roman Empire was conquered, the Eastern Roman Empire continued. We usually call it the Byzantine Empire. But if you traveled back in time and talked to the people living there, they would think that only a part of the Roman Empire had been conquered. So did people really think that the Earth was flat and that the world would end in the year 1000? Not from what I've read. People knew that the earth was round. They just didn't know how people could live on the opposite side. And there are really no documents showing that people were expecting the world to end in the year 1000 or 1000, whatever you want to call it. Medieval scientists actually made a lot of progress during the Middle Ages. And there were also a lot of new inventions like buttons, eyeglasses, and even glass windows. I think that it's really funny to imagine a medieval person with glasses. Yeah, we actually have some paintings to show that they had glasses, but they weren't as comfortable and as fancy as our glasses, but they worked. And sometimes we have the idea that the church was all a big, confusing mess during the Middle Ages. The early church was still okay because it was close to the time of the apostles. And then it was just a chaotic mess until Martin Luther came to clean things up. Yeah, I read that somewhere in a few books that I was reading, but what was it really like instead? Well, that is what we're going to ask our expert because he knows a lot more about it than we do, but I just know that this is quite an exaggeration. Yeah, I actually know very little about the Middle Ages. What about you, Christian? Same. You know, I know a little bit about them, major events, but not as much as I would like. I've heard about, you know, famous people like Thomas Aquinas, popes, crusades, um, People that I know the stories of, but not the name, monks, basically it until the Reformation. Yeah, Charlemagne, Thomas Aquinas, Marco Polo, and Joan of Arc are the major names that come to my mind. And Anselm. Simon Adekar also has written about Anselm. So clearly we have a lot to learn. So this time we'll cut our discussion short and leave more time for questions with our guest, Dr. Carl Truman, professor of biblical and religious studies at Grove City College. Dr. Truman has been our guest before for our episode on Athanasius, Arius and the Council of Nicaea. Dr. Truman, thank you so much for joining us again. We have a lot of questions for you today. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me on, Emma. So many Protestants avoid studying the medieval church because they think it was then that many unbiblical doctrines started. But you've always encouraged people to study it anyhow. Why is that? I think one of the mistakes Protestants make is is to think that the Reformation really rediscovered all Christian truth. In fact, what happens at the Reformation is the, the Reformers correct certain errors that have been taught and have developed during the Middle Ages. But the number of those errors and the range of those errors is really fairly small, very important, but actually fairly small. And an awful lot of what was taught in the in the Middle Ages uh, continues on into the Reformation. Most obviously would be the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, the doctrine of the incarnation, what we might call the doctrine of God in general. 
that's not really something that the reformers are, are dealing with. It's not something they're reforming. It's something that, by and large, they're they're very comfortable assuming from the Middle Ages because they see that the medieval uh, theologians had, had typically got that kind of stuff correct. Right. I guess it's really important that the church in the Middle Ages is still the church, even if there are some errors. So I heard you say in another interview that students in the Middle Ages studied the Bible much more than our seminarian students do now. Can you give an example? Yeah, I think I, in that lecture, I was talking about what one would have to do in order to, to be the equivalent of a seminary professor in the Middle Ages. Uh, as part of your training, as part of the, the, the curriculum that you had to go through, you would be expected to, to lecture on uh, many books of the Bible. Uh, now, again, there are certain differences between the Middle Ages and the Reformation. You would be lecturing, of course, on the Latin translation of the Bible. You'd be lecturing on the Vulgate. You would not be lecturing uh, from the Greek and the Hebrew texts, which is what Martin Luther and John Calvin and company would do. Uh, but you'd still be expected to, to be teaching on significant, great big chunks of the Bible. And typically today, if a student does an MDiv and, and then goes on to do a PhD, we, we operate with, with much more specialist kind of knowledge. Uh, the MDiv is in some ways a very broad survey relative to, to the Bible. And then when you move to PhD, uh, if you were doing a systematic theology PhD, you may not have to engage with the Bible very much at all. If you're doing a PhD in biblical studies, probably you'll choose a single book or a single theme or something pretty narrow. So medieval education is training men to, 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 to be those who taught theology in universities really required a much broader range of academic skills than would be typically the case today, included in which would be a more extensive uh, training in expanding What about the majority of people? Did the, the church school. try to keep them from reading the Bible? Well, again, that's an interesting question, and we have to sort of reframe it a little because, of course, you're dealing with a period of time where people generally couldn't read. You're probably talking less than 5% of the European population were able to, to read. Uh, and secondly, at a time where books were not readily available. So it's not, I mean, I'm looking uh, on the screen, I can see behind you, there's a bookshelf. It's full of books and papers. You would not have seen that in a typical home in the Middle Ages, because it's only with the advent of the printing press that book production becomes easy and books become cheaper and more accessible. So there's a sense in which you can't discourage people from reading the Bible when people can't get hold of the Bible and read it for themselves. Of course, where most people would get exposure to the teaching of the Bible would be in the church, in the in the worship service. And that would remain the same in the early Reformation, of course, as well, where most people still couldn't read. At that point, I think we'd have to say, actually, church commitment in the Middle Ages was not as strong as it should have been. Most people would not have been regularly in church. And even if they had been, the liturgy they would have heard and the Bible reading they would have heard, the Bible read, would have been in Latin. So they would not actually, many of them have been exposed to the teaching of the Bible in a form with which they were able to, uh, in which they would be able to understand it. So there is a sense in which, yes, the, the high flying medieval academics probably knew more about the Bible generally than your typical seminary professor would say, by the standards of their day. The ordinary Christian, though, would probably have known a lot less because they would not have been exposed uh, to the teaching of the word and will not have access to the teaching of the word in the way that, that we routinely have today. When we move on to the Middle Ages, it seems that all of a sudden we start talking about the Roman Catholic Church. But was it really called that at that time? And was it really the same as it is now? Well, first of all, it was not, not called the Roman Catholic Church, because, of course, certainly in, in Western Europe, there's only one church. If you'd grown up in a town in, or a village in Western Europe, you would never have had the choice of, you know, where do I go to church? Do I go to the Catholic Church, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Pentecostals? Barbara, that didn't exist. That really comes much, much later after the Reformation. There'd only have been one church in town. It would have been the Catholic Church. And Catholic means universal. And as far as Western Europe is concerned, there's one church. It's the universal church, and that's the church you go to. So 
Roman Catholic Church is really a, a, a bit of a Protestant way of referring to the church. Catholics today won't typically call themselves Roman Catholics. They'll refer to themselves as Catholics. Protestants refer to uh, Catholics in the Catholic Church as Roman Catholic in order to make the point that we regard our churches as part of the universal church. And the Catholic Church's claims, therefore, have to be particularized. Uh, it's a particular church that stands in relation to us. So, yeah, Roman Catholic is an easy way of referring to the church in the Middle Ages, but technically not correct. Is it the same church today as it was then? Well, the sort of yes and no. Uh, certainly the, the great creeds of the early church. We talked about this last time I was in the program. The great creeds would still be honoured and would be part of the liturgy. But certain things have become much more clearly defined in the Catholic Church since the Reformation. For example, Catholic Church has a position on justification, which it didn't have before Luther raised the question. And it's at the Council of Trent uh, from the 1540s onwards that the Church defines its position on justification. Secondly, after Vatican II, many masses are now said in the vernacular. You go to a mass in America and hear it in English. Whereas in the Middle Ages, it would have been in Latin. So th there's that difference. And there are certain doctrines that I would say have been sort of added on. Uh, for example, the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary has become official teaching of the church. The idea that Mary was conceived without original sin. That was not something that was required as a belief in the Middle Ages, but is now required as a belief. And then if you look at the reality of the institution, uh, it, it's in some ways, Catholicism is, a, is as varied as Protestantism. Uh, it just happens to be within the one church, but you have very liberal wings and you have very conservative wings. So Catholicism itself has become very practically diverse compared to, I think, what it would have been uh, in the during the, uh, the later Middle Ages. Right. So I guess in the hymnal at my church, there has all the creeds in the back and a lot of them use the word Catholic. But there's always like the footnote that's like, this is the lowercase c Catholic so yes. um, was the church pretty similar throughout Europe or were there large regional differences? And I'm sure that even in other continents like Asia and Africa, it would have been even more different. Yeah, I think uh, I, I'm not really qualified to answer that question in great degree. I'm not sure that we know entirely uh, whether that's the case or not. We could certainly point to architectural differences. And I think if you if you if you visit uh, German uh, medieval German cathedrals, there's a different aesthetic, for example, to that which you'll find in, in, in churches in, in Italy. Uh, there may be religious reasons for that, but I think also there's there's a difference in, in the way the Renaissance, for example, shaped things like church architecture and church decoration. So the church would no doubt have had regional variations. Of course, one of the problems we have is when we get when we get to asking questions like that, we're really asking questions about you know, what was it like for the individual Christian in this village or this town? And typically, we, we don't know that because many of them couldn't read or write, so they never wrote it, anything down. And if they could read and write, they typically didn't spend their time writing about how they felt about church. Mm. They would have used their skills for other things. It's a very difficult question to answer. And I think there'd be some variation, but ultimately there'd be an institutional coherence because all the dioceses ultimately looked to Rome for their authority. So what you said about the architecture sort of relates to my next question. So I love architecture and especially medieval architecture is just some of the most beautiful architecture. But why, why don't we build churches like that? What about the medieval architecture? Like, what does that tell us about the church at the time? And why don't we build churches like that? Well, that's a great question that could be answered in a number of ways. I mean, one, it took a long time. Uh, you know, Cologne Cathedral, they start building it in 1248, I think, and they complete building it, I think, around about 1880. Yeah, that's six, that's well over 600 years to build a cathedral. That was delayed a bit because of the Reformation. So we could take 200 years out of that, but that's still a very long time. We live in a very instantaneous, throwaway kind of age. Uh, we don't build things to last. Uh, we, you know, if I were to say to you, Emma, hey, if you could give me some of your allowance and I'm going to invest it in a building project that's going to take 600 years to complete, you're not going to give me your money. You're not going to invest in that because we live in an age where we like things happen quickly. We like to see the results 
of our labor. And I, I think that goes to something I find actually quite attractive about the Middle Ages compared to us. And it's this, that the people who built, say, Cologne Cathedral, uh, they knew that the world wasn't about that. It was worth on day one starting to build something that those builders knew they would never live to see completed. They would never worship in this church, but they still thought it was worth doing because they had a much bigger vision of their responsibility to future generations. And I think a much bigger vision of God. Their God was a great God and therefore warranted magnificent feats of imagination, magnificent exertions of creativity and strength that would last for centuries. So I think on that level, that speaks very well of the Middle Ages. And then when you get to the architectural design, there is a desire there to show this building is different. This building is special. It's not like a mud hut. It's not even like a castle. It's specifically designed to, in some sense, acknowledge the greatness and the transcendence of God. The great spires point to the heavens. It's, you know, Cologne Cathedral is massive. It's there. It's impressive. And I think it connects to uh, an understanding of what the Christian faith is. Uh, the building is not there uh, for a concert. It, it's there to reflect something of what the people think about God. And it's a special building. When you go in, I, I have the privilege of teaching at Grove City College. The chapel at Grove was built along, it was built in the 1920s, but it's designed along lines of a, a Reformation Anglican cathedral. And when you walk into the building with the great vaulted ceilings, and the stained glass windows, uh, and the beautiful uh, decor, you know you're entering a special place. You naturally hush, because there's a feel about the place that says, I should be quiet here, I should not make noise. So I think all of these things feed feed into medieval architecture. I do, you know, I'm not a fan of medieval Catholicism in many ways, but I, I do think the Christian imagination has lost something. And that is reflected in, in the kind of cheap throwaway church architecture we now, we now engage in. Yeah, architecture is so cool. Just the, the connection between worldview and the, the stuff that we build. Have you read, uh, by the way, Roger Scruton's book, The Aesthetics of Architecture? Have you read that? I haven't. I think you should read that. You would love it. He's not a Christian, but he's very sympathetic to the, the Christian way of thinking. But Roger Scruton, The Aesthetics of Architecture, very, very good book on, on how to think about buildings. I think you'd thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, we have two questions from our listeners and kept them till now because one of them is very generic. Here's the first one. Uh, I am Jake and I live in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And I was wondering about St. Francis of Assisi. He supposedly got the wounds of Christ. He got holes in his hands and his feet and a hole in his side, like Jesus. I don't know if this really happened or didn't happen or if this was someone else. Can you guys catch me up on him? Thank you. Dr. Truman, what do you think? Roman Catholics believe it's true and people reported getting these wounds even in more recent times. It seems like a very, um, it seems like a difficult question for a historian. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I mean, the, 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 they call them the stigmata. The, the marks of Christ in, in the hands and the side. And there are some modern manifestations, most famously uh, a man called Padre Pio, uh, who was a Dominican friar. He died in the late 1960s, but he was very famous for having these, these stigmata uh, in his hands. I think the ones on Francis, I mean, the sense in which they seem well attested. My own skepticism about them could well come from the fact that I'm a modern Western person and I'm just uncomfortable with these kind of things. I'm conscious of that when I read these stories, that I'm inclined to be skeptical. Uh, and yet, by all accounts, St. Francis seems to have been a good Christian man. Uh, the question of whether they were real for him or not, I'm not sure that we can really answer that decisively one way or the other. I think to extent, read the text and you decide how much weight to put in them. My concern about, for example, Padre Pio and modern stigmatics is that the the wound on San Padre Pio, typically in the palms of his hands from the pictures I've seen, well, that would not have been where the wounds of Christ were. Uh, if you were crucified, it's a bit tasteless to sort of think about this, but crucifixion would cru typically involve a, a nail being put through by the wrist joint, because if you just nailed in the hands, horrible to say, you would ultimately kind of, kind of tear through that. So I'm inclined to be skeptical about, about modern stigmatics. Uh, again, I don't know definitively. Uh, and 
my inclination is to be skeptical about St. Francis, but I want to be self-aware of my own sort of um, predispositions on this. I don't think there's been any biblical text that would lead us to uh, think about stigma. Paul talks about carrying the wounds of Christ in his body, but I don't think in context he's talking about stigma. I think he's talking about something else. Um, so the, that's a long way of saying I don't really know. Uh, read the texts, uh, think about them, and, and, and come to your own informed decision, I would suggest. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now another difficult question, this time from Zyla, who was 15, just like me. It's not specifically about the Middle Evil Church, but she wrote, why are there so many different religions and heresies in the world? Wow, that's a that's a difficult question. That's both an easy question, Zyla, and a difficult question. Uh, the easy answer is well, because people are sinful, and they will always try to make God in their own image, and they will, they will always try to create their own their own religions. When I was at my final year at high school, before I became a Christian, uh, uh, my year. Uh, uh, we invented a religion. I seem to remember. We we brought a stone in from the 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 field, and we called it the Om Stone. And we would worship it each morning. It was just a bit of a joke, in some ways, to wind up the teachers. But you say that's what human beings do. They they invent gods for themselves. The the more complicated question, of course, is well, why do they do these particular religions in these particular places? And I think that you know that has as many answers as there are heresies. Mm-hmm. So, for example, we might look at. Um, say, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the emergence of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Why do the Jehovah's Witnesses emerge uh, when they do and believe the way they do? The simple answer is, well, they're they're sinful, and and people invent religions for themselves. The more complicated answer would connect to, well, it was a particular period in time when end-time prophecies were were gripping the imagination, when people thought the world was coming to a catastrophic end. And, And this meant that as people invented religions for themselves, They were inclined to tilt towards answering the kind of questions that were uh, uh, fermenting in society at that particular point. So when you come, you know, the the simple answer gives you the universal answer. The more interesting answer really would have to relate to individual heresies. We could go back to the early church and say, you know, in the early church, there seemed to be some people who denied the humanity of Christ. Why did they deny the humanity of Christ? Well, on one level, uh, one could say, because they they wanted to emphasize his divinity. That's actually a good thing. The problem there is that it's so emphasizing his divinity over against those who might have denied it, they miss a fundamental aspect of the truth. So there again, you have a heresy that one can explain, explain the content of that heresy related, related to the specific moment in time at which it occurred. Well, thank you so much for answering all our questions. But before you go, we'll end with two easy questions. What do you like to do in your free time? And if you can meet one person from the medieval church, who would you like to meet? (laughs) Well, in my free time, uh, I I like to cycle. got a road bike. I live in a beautiful part of the country, so I like to do a lot of road biking. I'm trying to learn the bluegrass banjo, but uh, uh, that's fallen by the wayside due to general busyness for the last few months. But over the summer... I hope to get back to my banjo uh, uh, and learning how to play it. And the character I'd like to meet from the Middle Ages. Wow, that's a, uh, that's an interesting, interesting one. I think uh, theologically Thomas Aquinas, uh, because there's a story told about Thomas Aquinas that he would write four or five books at the same time. And he would sit in a room and he'd have his different assistants and he would dictate a line from one book to one assistant. And while that assistant was writing it down, he would dictate a line from another book to the next assistant. And that would seem to indicate to me he had a very interesting mind. If he's able to hold five books in his head at the same time and know which sentence he's got to dictate to which person, I think he'd be a very, very interesting person to meet and to talk to. So probably Thomas Aquinas. Dr. Truman, we are so thankful that you decided to spend this time with us and share your knowledge. It is always I had a lovely time. Thank yeah, it's always much. a pleasure to learn from you, but we'll say goodbye for now. Before we go, we just want to remind our listeners, if you have a question or comment, you can email it to questions at Kids Talk Church History and enter to win a copy of Simonetta Carr's most recent book, Church History, which was named Best Children's Nonfiction by World Magazine. And on our website, you will also find past episodes, special offers, news, recommended readings, and more. And don't forget to tell your friends where they can find us. In partnership with the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals and on behalf of my co-hosts, Trinity and Christian, I'm Emma. Thank you for listening to Kids Talk Church History.